Hello, everybody. Welcome to this webinar on investor state. Uh, this uh, investors ISDS reforms. It's a very uh, important and contemporary topic. My name is uh, Gaurav Banerjee. I am the vice chairman of the UNCCI, which is the Ancitral National Coordination Committee for India. Uh, and the reason we are uh, highlighting this topic is because of the work that UNCITRAL is doing on this at the moment. UNCITRAL, as you all know, is the UN uh, Commission on International Trade Law, of which India is a founder member. And Working Group 3 is uh, debating this very important issue at the moment. Um, just by way of background, since this is hosted by, co-hosted by JGLS, Jindal, and ICA, just by way of background. Uh, so far as India is concerned, we uh, had a tryst with uh, BIT disputes, initially in Dabol, which got settled. Then, of course, there was the White Australia case, which brought the uh, dispute into the limelight. The government of India reacted. It uh, cancelled a large number of treaties, it uh, recalibrated its uh, uh, model BIT, and the Law Commission has also pronounced upon it. So it's a topic which is relevant to India as well, and India needs to uh, take a view as to what it would like in the reforms process. Uh, and to talk more about uh, these reforms, we have a cast of four speakers from different parts of the world. Uh, I start with Bahrain, where, from where we have uh, Jan Paulson, the founding partner of Three Crowns LLP. Uh, you, he's a noted international figure. He's been arbitrating since 1975. He's been the past president of ICA and the LCIA. And frankly, he ne really needs no further introduction. Moving on to our second speaker, who has got up very early for this webinar uh, and who comes to us from Washington, D.C. We have Meg Kinnear, who is the Secretary General of the International Center for Settlement of Investment Disputes, better known as ICSID. We have all heard of ICSID, uh, and it's administering at the moment 300 odd um, investment arbitrations every year. Again, uh, Meg is a very well-known international figure and I will not further introduce her. Uh, we, uh, whatever I say will be inadequate. I move on to our uh, third speaker, my friend uh, who's coming, from, coming in from London, Manish Agarwal, who is a partner at Three Crowns, who has a specialist practice in, in investment arbitrations. And he brings to the table his practical knowledge and experience of this field, particularly from the point of view of the investor and what he might want to say on the reforms process. Last but not the least from Delhi, Professor James Nedumpara, who is, uh, who is part of Jindal, but is on leave. And the only reason he's on leave is because he's heading the Center for Trade and Investment Law, which has been established by the government of India at the uh, IIFL, and he is a specialist uh, and he has experience of the WTO and its appellate uh, authority, and that will, of course, be very relevant for our discussion. Uh, to moderate this uh, very distinguished panel, we have two equally distinguished moderators. We have Marie Paulson, who is uh, a senior advisor at ASG, and she is a leading expert on treaty compliance by states, as also the New York Convention. And she has been taking particular, particular interest in this area. In fact, we've, we at UNCCI have had a series of webinars on ISDS reforms. And finally, uh, we have uh, Pramod Nair, who heads Arista Chambers. He uh, uh, currently represents the Republic of India in a number of BIT arbitrations. Um, one of which he has won hands down. India has been awarded the entire costs in the Astro matter. And he also finds time, I do not know how, 
to teach uh, investment uh, arbitration law at the NLS. So these uh, ladies and gentlemen are your panel and your uh, moderators. And with that, I hand over to the moderators to take the session forward. Thank you. Thank you, Gurab. Welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. We're expecting a lot of participants today. It's uh, almost August and during this lockdown, we have seen webinars on this topic, I would say every Saturday. Saturday is the popular day for ISDS reforms and hopefully after this summer, we will have learned a lot and um, we will be able to provide state delegations with perhaps more informed insights as to both the incremental reforms and the structural reforms. Um, what are we gonna talk about today? At, at this point, we looked at, uh, along with, with our colleagues in India and the National Committee uh, for UNSTRAL in India, what are the remaining burning billion dollar questions? We know now that one question is the New York Convention. We've tried to answer it. And one thing that we know is that we don't know. Um, the other thing that we will have seen is um, the appellate mechanism or the appellate body. A lot of world leading experts have said this summer, the multilateral investment court, where is the building going to be? Who is going to fund it? How are we going to appoint the judges? How are we going to enforce these judgments? Maybe this is the impossible dream from the man from La Mancha. What we're going to try to look at today is the appellate body equally the impossible dream from the man from La Mancha. So what we're going to do first, um, we're going to have a bit of a helicopter view, sort of the umbrella about the multilateral investment court. Maybe we, we can say the last things that need to be said about that. Um, then we're going to look at the system that we know today. Do we need to throw the baby out with the bathwater or can we keep it and tweak it a little bit? And then lastly, we're going to look at the appellate body. So with that, I would like to give the floor to somebody on the second floor in this house, um, Jan Polson. He is going to uh, hopefully, hopefully have the final word on the multilateral investment court. Jan, over to you. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. It's uh, so much fun to be on this magic carpet and be in so many places at the same time even though I'm sitting all alone in my room. Uh, it's, uh, it's a new way of traveling and it has, uh, has some definite advantages, uh, even though I cannot see the whites of all of your eyes. Uh, I suggest that before we start reflecting on uh, these momentous issues, uh, we consider some uh, propositions which I believe to be true and which I think we all need to come to terms with uh, as we reflect on the advisability of, of various steps and, and the criteria by which we assess the attractiveness of reforms. So I will state these propositions in a categorical form because I believe them to be true. I don't purport to state what inferences one should make from these propositions or what implications there are. I suggest that we all need to come to terms with what, the, what we think those implications are. Here are the um, propositions which I think are true. First of all, foreign aid will not save the world. Secondly, investment flows do not depend on the existence of investment treaties. Thirdly, nevertheless, I might say, there is a causal relationship between the availability of neutral adjudication and investment. And fourth, amateurish, or let's say uninformed iconoclasm can have seriously detrimental consequences for states. So a few words about each of these. Um, not long ago in one uh, of these webinars, uh, my very good friend, uh, Salim Mulan, uh, commented on uh, what he had seen me do in yet another uh, a webinar where I showed a graph and he said, well, you can always, you can always show graphs and statistics, but you know, there, there, there are issues of, uh, of causality, um, causation. Uh, and I want to uh, call your attention to the point I was trying to make when I showed that graph. It wasn't, it wasn't discussed in any detail. Uh, I hope you can see it. 
uh, here it is. It's a graph which shows the evolution of two things. The solid line is direct foreign investment and the spotted line is foreign aid. For half a century, from 1960 to 2010. Interesting, we know that the first BIT was signed, uh, so, so Lore has it, in 1959. Um, and uh, here you have foreign direct investment taking off mightily uh, in about 1980. And there's a hiccup in about 2008, we all know why. Uh, and that's a V recovery, brilliant, and up again. And in the meanwhile, uh, foreign direct investment stays put with single, single digit movements. Now, um, uh, I think my friend Salim suggested, well, this doesn't prove very much about the importance of um, investment treaties. Uh, and, and, and I know the difference between correlation and, ca and causation. Um, it, it is, there is a very, very high correlation between people who become serious drug addicts and people who drank milk when they were infants. But that actually isn't a reason to outlaw milk uh, because there's no causation between the two. I, I do understand that. Uh, but it's curious, isn't it? Uh, about 1980, when we start the phenomenon of BITs, there's uh, quite a lot of foreign investment. And I think there are studies that, um, that indicate uh, that there, there is something to be said for this. But that really isn't my point. My point is, don't believe that we're going to feed, shelter, supply health services, and educate the world's population on the basis of foreign aid. There isn't that much generosity in the world and there are competing pressures, pressures uh, for national taxpayers. My second proposition is that investment flows do not depend on the existence of investment treaties. Investments will occur across borders even if there are no such treaties, we know that. But we need to think about the implications of that. There are consequences. How about the quality of investments? Will there be long-term investments? Will there be investments by investors who are purely transactional and will want 25% return on their investments you know, for as many months or a few years as their good friend is in charge of something in the local country and then get out quickly. That's not the kind of investment you want. There will be investment. There will be investment even in the most unpromising environments as long as there is something to be uh, obtained there. Um, why did those who drafted investment laws and investment treaties. What were they thinking? Why did they, did they draft investment laws uh, containing uh, neutral adjudica adjudication provisions? And why did they draft investment treaties? Did they do it because they wanted multinational corporations to be more profitable? You can't be serious. Every single author of investment laws was a member of a parliament or some such uh, 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 norm making uh, instrument of a state. They are thinking that they have a duty to think about the welfare of their population and not foreign multinational corporations. Um, every single dra uh, negotiator of a bilateral investment treaty, the same. So I say that the purpose of what we call investment protection promotion treaties is not to protect investments. That's not the fundamental purpose. The fundamental purpose of investment treaties is to foment durable investment at the lowest possible cost of capital, the lowest possible political risk premiums. You will always have investors, but you want durable investors who are good citizens and who stay there for a long time. Now, before, um, the advent of investor treaty, we, we had foreign investment and there was no uh, neutral adjudication in accordance with um, investment laws or, or, or treaties to speak of. And yet there was investor state arbitration under contractual clauses. And there was a rich lore of studies about the nature of cross-border in investment. And some of these studies were extremely sophisticated. Those who were around at that, I, I could cite a number of them, but 
uh, one particularly famous one. Some of you uh, will have read it, and those of you who, who, who are too young should go and get a hold of a copy of, of a book called Sovereignty at Bay, Raymond Vernon. Very serious study. I think he uh, analyzed something like 200, I think it, from memory, 187 American corporations who invested abroad. This is not doctrinaire opinions about um, a dogma. This is analysis of what happened when these uh, American uh, enterprises invested in different countries and what was the evolution over time. Did they have first mover advantages because they had the technology, they had the capital? What happened over time to their investments and the like? And did this result in what he called the potential for sovereignty at bay? Very interesting. Uh, and back in those days, there was investor state arbitration, tended not to involve small and medium-sized investors because they really didn't have the prominence to be negotiating with governments. But the big corporations were there and they could negotiate their treaties with arbitration clauses. And that is what we will go back to if there isn't anything else, obviously. People are not going to invest without any assurance. Um, it was, uh, I, I heard the other day that um, uh, investors, uh, you, you can have investment without treaties at all. And the example, I, I hear this quite often, the example is Brazil. Well, they have foreign investors. I just said, you will always have investment. But is Brazil a really good example? Um, anybody who's been to Brazil loves Brazil, and I do too. But the fact of their international trade arrangements for the last decade has been, unfortunately, a very sad story of enormous embarrassment as a result of corruption. And, and just about a week ago, uh, a US federal appeals court upheld an arbitral award, I think for something on the order of almost six, $700 million in favor of a Taiwanese deep, deep water drigging company. Uh, which sued for breach of contract against Petrobras. Um, allegations were made of corruption and the tribunal held that um, the award, uh, tribunal uh, awarded uh, six, 660, 700 million dollars, uh, presided by um, William Park, known to many of you, uh, somebody who I don't think is uh, known to be anything but hostile to, to corruption. But he noted that um, uh, the corruption allegations were known at the time the contract was signed, and therefore it was ratified. So that's the kind of thing you see in, in, in when, when contractual um, initiatives go wrong uh, with, with that type of investment. Um, serious investors only want neutrality. They want the rule of law, not the rule of influence. And what they fear is chaotic decision making. Uh, volt fusses that take place as soon as there is a change of government. Um, the power of local influences rather than law. Uh, local influences who might be eager to replace and evince a successful foreign investor. I'm not saying this uh, with any animaversions uh, against uh, uh, the South as opposed to the North. I've uh, defended enough uh, uh, states uh, in investor state arbitration to, 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 to feel very much at ease at saying this. This is a concern everywhere. Um, on July 10th, just very, very short period of time ago, uh, the European Justice Scorecard was published for 2020, the European Justice Scorecard by the European Convention, Con Commission. Its finding as a result of an extensive public survey was that, that in two thirds of the EU member states, popular perception of judicial independence has decreased, decreased. And I quote, the reason being the, the perception of interference and pressure from governments and politicians. It may, makes sense to neutralize that fear if you want to achieve uh, uh, investment in, on good terms. Now, uh, a few words on the third proposition, the causal relationship between the availability of neutral adjudication and investment. The causal relationship is there. There have been a number of studies which are interesting and which tend to show that, but uh, I'm going to prove it axiomatically. If you speak to multinational corporations who have a rate of return, which is the, a trip rate um, under which they will not invest, and uh, they have alternatives to investment, part of the calculation of that rate has to do with their perception of legal risks. And they will go elsewhere and they will 
require uh, uh, in all marginal cases, and almost all cases are marginal because they have alternatives. Uh, they, 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 they prize neutrality. Um, let me give you the example of all examples. Some decades ago, the Disney Corporation announced that it was going to have an investment in Europe called Euro Disneyland. Um, there were many countries that competed for it. Spain was a top competitor. They have sunshine, but they're not right in the middle of Europe. So if you want to have the maximum market with people taking a day trip to Euro Disneyland, you want to be somewhere in the middle. Uh, how about France, which is a bit rainy and it's not that, uh, not that attractive in the winter, but it has that advantage. Euro Disneyland was hesitating, had the choice to make, but Euro Disneyland wanted neutral adjudication in case there was a dispute as to the many things that could cause um, uh, 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 cause friction, building such a large park, huge park, so close to Paris, uh, and knowing not that much about French administrative law. So they wanted international arbitration. The French resisted. So we don't do that. It's as a matter of sovereignty, and uh, we have a long tradition of administrative law, and you can trust us. And Euro Disney says, yes, well, we really, we're really keen on this. And finally, the French parliament literally had to pass a special law called the Euro Disney law to allow for international arbitration. So I'll tell you, there is a causal connection. Finally, um, well, I, I might say that today, uh, there have been so many decisions that there is disaffection from both sides. Some states have lost a lot of cases and they're disaffected. But let me also say that a number of investors have lost and they're not, uh, they're not happy either. Um, it, uh, I heard somebody said not long ago that well, you know, in the investor state arbitration, 60% of cases, uh, the investor has won. Well, I'm surprised that it wouldn't be a higher number because before an investor actually sues a state, considering how costly and how lengthy that process is, and the perils of having to, to enforce against sovereign immunity, you think twice before you do it, and you're not going to do it unless you're rather sure of yourself. So it doesn't surprise me that um, uh, uh, the success rate would be 60%. If you count success rate as saying you won something, but the next thing you want to know is how much of the claim prospered. And sometimes it's a very small fraction and the, the investor is actually, dis uh, is actually disappointed. And finally, finally, and most importantly, let us say that we could aggregate in dollar terms every single amount which investors have won in investor state arbitration. And we knew what amount that was. It's a hundred, million, billion, whatever, take a number. How much of that has been collected by the investor? I have no idea. I would be surprised if it's 50%. So you factor that in as well. There is some disaffection on both sides. Now, uh, my final proposition. Uh, as I said, uh, uninformed, I call it, if, it's, if you're uninformed in, in, in considering the importance of these issues, you're, am, you're an amateur. You need to be informed. Uh, uninformed iconoclasm can have seriously detrimental consequences for states. So let's be honest. For those who are stating their opinions in this, in this area, do they have a doctrinaire aim? Is there aim simply to reduce investor protection as close as possible to nothing because they think that there's something inherently um, deleterious about investor protection. Investor will always want to be acting um, against the public interest and will want to disregard uh, regulatory, uh, proper regulatory behavior of the states or not. Uh, if that is a doctrinaire aim, let's have it out in the clear and let's say so and see what the states really want. And when I say states, I'm not talking so much about ministries of foreign affairs as minister of commerce, minister of trade, minister of health, minister of public works who wants roads built, et cetera, et cetera. I think you see what I mean. May I also point out that different states have different priorities. Some states now have emerged into kind of a hybrid state where there is a very large middle class and a significant capacity to generate capital formation in their own country. And they feel less urgency about this. So all states are not, are not alike. Um, and my final word on this, ultimately, when we're considering all of these reforms, the devil is in the detail. And it's 
I submit, it's no good to say, well, all these interesting questions about who decides and who will decide the people who will decide, uh, what will be the criteria, who will pay for this exercise. Um, those are important questions and we need to resolve them before we actually say this is the way we're going to go. May I remind you um, that when ICSID was created in 1964 and got going in 1966, uh, it took two decades before anything happened. Are we going to dismantle the entire system of investor state dispute now, create something else which will not have proved itself, and what will happen for 20 years until there is uh, the generation of the kind of confidence in the best case? Exit has been a success this way because people have used it, but it took 20 years even to get started. Those are my initial remarks for the things I think we need to consider as a matter of the implications of the choices to be made in this area. Thank you. Thank you. Pramod, I'm going to ask you to briefly react to that and then we'll move on to the status quo and what ICSID is doing today. Over to you, Pramod. Thanks, Marik. Um, uh, Jan, that was, that was certainly very illuminating and I think it, it sets the context very well uh, for the debate about ISDS reform. Uh, just a few uh, points which I thought I would probably raise for your consideration and you could probably it'd be fantastic to have your views at the uh, end possibly uh, during question time. You mentioned that uh, foreign aid uh, is not going to be a, a solution uh, to much of the developing world. Uh, and is, 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 I mean, my question is, is it really uh, the right thing to do to see uh, development as being uh, something which is driven by two engines, the engine of foreign investment on one hand and, uh, uh, and aid, foreign aid on the other. Uh, there could be so many other reasons uh, as to, uh, there could be so many other engines that states could rely on for their economic development. Uh, for instance, uh, foreign trade uh, could be a much better alternative to foreign aid. Uh, I think there are, uh, uh, I mean, uh, in the developing world nowadays, uh, foreign aid probably seems to have a negative connotation. Uh, it's uh, sometimes viewed as being um, a, a measure, a band-aid measure for uh, colonial powers to probably assuage their guilt pangs. Uh, the amounts that are involved are too small to actually make a huge difference for the development needs of the uh, developing world. Uh, and therefore, what states have done is they have looked at a number of um, economic engines in order to um, uh, to pursue their own levels of development and, and foreign trade is one, uh, a domestic channeling of uh, um, a capital is another. Um, there is of course foreign which has gone on irrespective of whether states have had ISDS or whether they've had BITs and so on. And therefore there could be many, many reasons as to, or there could be many alternatives for states. So it's not as though if you don't have ISDS or if you don't have BITs, uh, there would be very few tools available for states to uh, to pursue uh, their development agenda, as it were. In terms of the, the causal connection between um, maybe uh, BITs and ISDS and increased levels of uh, foreign investment, uh, I think there could be certain reasons which are macroeconomic, which could explain the spike in the levels of foreign investment in the 1980s. It need not be uh, that states were entering into more BITs at this period in time. Uh, this was also the period many countries across the world embarked upon uh, structural adjustment programs and programs of economic liberalization. Uh, more open economies have attracted foreign investment into sectors which were simply not open previously to receiving foreign investment. Uh, so for, uh, to decide the case of India, the banking and finance sector, the insurance sector, the, the pharma sector, the telecom sector, were all actually out of bounds for foreign investors for a long period of time until uh, India pursued a program of economic liberalization in the 1990s. So when many of these sectors opened up, uh, foreign investment was welcomed and foreign investment flowed in. And therefore, it may be a bit difficult to establish that there is a correlation between uh, countries which had a robust BIT program or, uh, or chose ISDS and the fact that they were able to probably attract more foreign capital. Uh, there are also a few interesting statistics which uh, emanate out of India. Uh, so for instance, India has had BIT since the 1990s, but until around 2007, foreign investment into India never exceeded uh, $2 billion on an annual basis. Uh, India terminated around 57 BITs. 
uh, some may say as a bit of a knee-jerk reaction to the adverse decision in white industries. Uh, but this year was also quite interesting because 2017-18 saw the largest flows of foreign investment to India ever. Uh, around uh, 9 billion uh, USD flowed into India in the same year in which it terminated uh, BITs and it terminated the possibility of ISDS for new investments in India. Of course, the old investments were still protected by sunset clauses uh, in existing BITs. Uh, in fact, in this uh, COVID uh, period itself, in, in the month of May and June, India, uh, one company in India attracted around uh, $20 billion worth of investment. And this company operates in the oil and the telecom sectors, sectors which have been traditionally volatile in the Indian context. Uh, it has spawned many uh, disputes, including the IT disputes, some of which you may have acted on, Jan. And therefore, as far as investors are concerned, as long as there is a decent return to be made, as long as there is capital to be deployed uh, uh, in places where they have an assured rate of return of maybe 12% or 15%, as compared to negative returns elsewhere, uh, foreign capital will be deployed irrespective of the levels of protection. You're absolutely right that you know, if a country does not have a robust investment protection program, uh, investors would price in uh, a political risk adjustment, and therefore there could be a risk premium for investments that are made. Maybe the rates of return will have to be probably two or three percent higher to cater for the increased risk on account of the lack of ISDS protection. But I don't think ISDS protect, uh, uh, investments flows would actually dry up. Uh, and, and the last point, you know, I think uh, we will, of course, discuss this in greater detail. You mentioned that uh, as far as serious investors are concerned, uh, they really look to a system which can uh, assure them uh, adherence to the principle of rule of law. And uh, do, you, do you think that investors would really have legitimate apprehensions about having disputes resolved before a, a multilateral investment court? Uh, well, of course, the multilateral investment court will be comprised of judges from the, the developing countries and the developed countries. Uh, capital exporting countries will, of course, uh, listen to their constituencies of, in, of investors who invest offshore and, and would ensure that their interests are not sacrificed uh, uh, whilst uh, uh, MIC is being created. And therefore, uh, isn't it sometimes a good thing to have a proliferation of international tribunals? Uh, ICSID was created in 1966, but uh, uh, there was already the Permanent Court of Arbitration, which was probably a forum uh, which could resolve disputes between investors and, uh, and, uh, and states. The creation of ICSID hasn't really jeopardized that system. It has only strengthened the system. So uh, would not the creation of an additional forum uh, for, for uh, investors and states actually strengthen the rule of law rather than dilute it? I think Sorry, you're mute. Yes, well, I think what we can do, there, there's another interesting question, Pramod, which also relates to some of the things that you've brought up and that Jan has brought up. Um, there is a question from the audience, which is again a little bit about the connection between BITs, ISDS, and foreign direct investment. Uh, there's a reference to um, the US, the Netherlands, UK, and Germany. Those are the countries that use ISDS the most. Um, but now, even with the developed countries, we see new types of treaties like the USMCA. And the question is here, um, really, what, what fuels foreign investment? Um, isn't it more environment, the infrastructure, connectivity, internal economic reform, etc., then BITs. So the reference that's being given from Audrey is very interesting, and we talked about this. Um, India has the biggest investment flows from the U.S. without a BIT. This also came up uh, at one of the other webinars. So this is not Brazil. We're talking about the about India and the U.S. So with that, given that we're, we're about to run um, over time and I'm being Dutcher and forcing time, um, Perhaps, Pramod, we, we can now talk about, about exit, about the current system. In that context, before we give the floor to Meg, could you enlighten us a little bit about India and, and the flow from the US as, as is um, posed in this question? Uh, sorry, Marika, I didn't quite uh, catch the last part of the question. Uh, so in this question, um, there is a reference to India not having BITs with the US, yet there's a lot of flow of, of, of investment coming from the US. And you, um, you, I mean, India, India is not a, a party to the exit convention. I would like you to react to that briefly, and then we can give the floor to Meg to talk about exit and 
the many improvements that we see. Uh, I think that's true. I think uh, in terms of uh, the United States, it's probably one of the most crucial uh, trading partners that India has. Uh, in terms of investment into India, I think the US uh, is probably number four on the list. A lot of investments are channeled into India via Singapore and Mauritius, mainly for tax reasons. So I'm sure that a lot of US investors also channel their investments into India through Singapore and Mauritius. But even otherwise, US, the United States of America stands at number four in, in respect of the inward investment coming into India. And that has happened without uh, a, a BIT in place between India and the United States. Uh, there has been a BIT that has been under discussion for quite some time, but nothing has been concluded yet. Uh, but that doesn't actually mean that there is no regime of investment, uh, of, uh, investment protection for US investors into India. Uh, Gaurav mentioned the, the Dabol uh, dispute initially in his introductory remarks. Uh, this was a case where investors uh, in a power plant in the state of Maharashtra in India uh, actually commenced treaty proceedings against India. In addition, there were proceedings under political risk insurance policies that some of these investors had. Uh, India is a party to the uh, multilateral investment guarantee agency uh, uh, agreement, and therefore the MIGA does offer a layer of protection uh, under the political risk insurance scheme for foreign investors from the US, and that's been actually availed of, including in the Dabol case. And uh, uh, but, but the fact is that India does attract uh, investment from a number of countries with which it does not have an investment treaty. Uh, and even after the termination of India's uh, BIT in 2017, the investment flows into the country have not really dropped. So there are, as you mentioned, Marik, uh, very many complex factors which make a country attractive for um, foreign investment. And the existence of BIT protections, although uh, it's an important factor, may not be the exclusive factor which uh, actually drives an investment decision. Great. And, and with that, Meg, we'll, we'll give the floor to you. Um, it, it's very much my wish, um, if I could do so, that we, we enlighten the public and delegations and stakeholders how, how really well the, the current system works. And if there is criticism, so this was also mentioned in one of these questions, the Arbitrator Club, you know, these issues can very well be resolved within the current system. So, so Meg, I'll give you the floor to, to share a little bit about that. Well, thank you very much. I'm really pleased to join you. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about what people call incremental reform or reform of the current system. And ICSID has really had just a program of continuous improvement. And I think uh, that is obviously the way to go. Uh, some will remember that in 2006, ICSID passed a number of amendments. First of all, increasing transparency of the system and in particular allowing for amicus or third party participation, as well as uh, the new motion basically to strike a case for absence of legal merit. Uh, the idea and the concern we've heard about, are there frivolous cases? Well, this was a way to have an early strikeout motion of frivolous cases. So that was the 2006 amendments. In 2017, we started a, what's been the most comprehensive amendment process to date. Uh, and it has also been the most transparent process to date. We have had four working papers. They are all almost telephone book size, uh, explaining what are possible amendments, but also what are the pros and cons? What are the likely outcomes of those amendments? And these have gone to our states and to the public. We've had more than 100 public sessions. We've had three week-long, very intense sessions with our states. And so this has really been a very transparent, interactive kind of process. Uh, we were hoping before COVID to finish this and to put it to members for a vote uh, towards uh, the end of 2020. We are going to try and stay as close to possible onto our schedule. Uh, and that means probably that it will be voted on sometime early to mid 2021 and enforced perhaps by the end of 2021. And I think one of the important things to note here is not only is this so-called incremental reform a way to respond to concerns, but it is a way to do so in a very concrete, pragmatic, and relatively quick manner. When you think about how long many international processes take, uh, this is one that is relatively rocket speed, frankly, uh, for international 
reform and change. So let me give you an idea of some of the kinds of changes that are being looked at at this point, because I think you can see that they respond very directly to a lot of the concerns we hear in the public debate. So for example, there is a provision that deals with third party funding and a requirement to disclose the existence of third party funding and the name of the funder and to be able to ensure there are no conflicts or inappropriate relationships in that respect. There is a provision with respect to security for costs. As you know, security for costs has been available before as a provisional measure. Uh, this allows security for costs and puts a specific test in place. And that's something that a lot of parties, in particular, I think states, have been concerned about with the current system. Uh, there are proposals to further increase transparency. There are proposals to have hard timelines for the achievement of each of the various steps. One of the concerns we often hear is it takes too long and time equals money here. The longer a case takes, the, lo the more it is likely to cost in terms of its prosecution and defense. So to give you an idea, awards will be required to be provided within eight months of the final hearing. So we have these hard deadlines in place. Uh, we have also increased the ability to consolidate cases or where they can't be consolidated for jurisdictional reasons to do what we're calling coordination. And this of course addresses some of the concerns about co consistency and coherence. We have put in place a voluntary or by consent expedited arbitration process, but to give you an idea where the parties to follow that to the letter the time of a case would be about 50% less than the time of the average case today. And those are just changes to arbitration rules. We've also gone and updated the conciliation process to make it a much more uh, flexible ADR process the way we know ADR processes today. We have completely revised the fact-finding rules. They have never been used and it would not surprise me if there was not huge uptake, but it is yet another instrument that is available. And in terms of new instruments, ones that I think is very important and that I think will be used is that we have made a set of standalone mediation rules. And we've heard in particular, I think from states, but also from investors, that they would like to have more option to mediate. So you can see how what is being proposed in the amendments really addresses and responds to the kinds of concerns that we have heard in the public dialogue. So that gives you a bit of a flavor of the amendment process. The other process we've been involved in right now that I'd like to mention in terms of incremental reform is the Code of Conduct. For ICSID, the Code of Conduct obviously came up in the context of its amendment process, but we also saw that this was being brought up in the context of Working Group 3. And we spoke with the ANSA trial secretariat, and I think everybody felt it made sense to have something as close as possible to a universal code of conduct, a code of conduct that would apply regardless of the set of investment rules that were used in the particular case. So we were given a working mandate from the states to go out and try to prepare a draft code of conduct. And that code was released this spring You'll see it's on the ICSID website and the UNCITRAL website. And essentially it applies to adjudicators and our instructions were to make it applicable to basically all decision makers in investor state. So that's arbitrators, annulment committee members, and if there were ever a court or an appellate body, it would with some uh, changes obviously for context, but it would apply to them. So it's meant to be broadly applicable. Uh, in its Article 3, it has the basic duties and responsibilities of the decision makers or the arbitrators, adjudicators. Uh, they are probably the ones you would obviously expect, first and foremost, to be independent and impartial. Uh, duties of competence, diligence, availability, to respect confidentiality, those kinds of duties that you see in codes of conduct. And then Articles 4 to 11 expand on these notions. Finally, Article 12 addresses enforcement. Um, if I can uh, 
put it broadly, uh, this code of conduct would certainly increase the amount of disclosure required so that parties are really on a level playing field. And it tries to address the concerns we hear, things like conflict of interest, issue conflict, and multiple roles, what, what some people call um, double hatting, which I don't think is a very helpful word or proxy, but in any event, playing multiple roles and when those two multiple roles overlap to the point where it does cause concern about independence and impartiality. Um, the, di the discussion will continue again once UNCITRAL is able to have meetings, uh, will continue on the code of conduct. It is a first draft meant for discussion, but it has been well received and in particular I think the idea of having this broadly applicable code of conduct has been very well received and I think we will ultimately see a consensus version in working group three and then we will take that to our exit member states and say let's uh, if you are in agreement let's attach this to our declaration of arbitrators and incorporate it into the exit scheme so I think when you look at the kinds of reforms that are ongoing it tells you that the current system is definitely responding and reacting and fully able to deal with the kinds of issues that are of concern to stakeholders and able to do it in a way I think that uh, maintains the balance between investors and states and that's been one of the primary driving forces for us if you're going to have a useful system you have to maintain that balance thank you thank you Megan I think that is something that is now being recognized um, by all stakeholders also those who were initially in favor of a multilateral investment board or appellate body they too uh, acknowledge that the system has to be fair for the users, the users being the investors and the state respondents. Coming back to, to double hatting, so you know the elephant in the room, we had a discussion about this um, at an earlier webinar where Maxi Schreeder said, well, how about we call it multiple hats and how about we talk about regulation instead of a ban? And I think, again, what is important about when I refer to informed choices, what are we talking about? Some have said that these concerns can be addressed by the rules on conflicts of interest. Some actually conflate conflicts of interest and there, there are certain, certain things that have happened recently. They have been covered by, by Global Arbitration Review and, and Law 360. Arbitrators who have decided not to disclose a connection with, with an expert. Can't those be dealt with, with, with rules on conflict of interest? Why I am particularly worried as, as a, a longtime advocate for diversity is that if we would have any type of absolute broad ban instead of regulation, um, we will be left with either retired judges or a certain demographic of those arbitrators who will say, I'm at that stage in my career, close to retirement, and I'm happy to just be an arbitrator. But this, this immense pool of, of younger arbitrators that we currently have, uh, where there's a gender equality, uh, regional, uh, minority, God knows what have you. And, and I'm not saying that because we have to have diversity because it's right, which we've heard a lot in US debates. I'm not saying that because it's right. I'm saying that because many of these arbitrators are excellent. And, and those are the arbitrators who organically know what ethics mean. And, and so what I would like to just plant a seed here is that, that, that provision on double hatting or a ban is something I think that the, the delegations need to look into and, and that will be something I would want to revisit. Um, now Manish, you are in the field, you represent the users, also the investors. And what I would like to hear from you is, you know, we have incremental reforms to structural reforms. Don't you think that, that with the incremental reforms and, and tweaking the system, incremental reforms that are actually in a sense structural, that we could address the criticism? So, uh, thanks, Marike. It's, uh, uh, you know, in terms of my own practice, I represent both investors and states. So what I propose to do is actually present an arbitration practitioner's perspective based on my experience in this field over the last decade and also based on my work with the IBA's subcommittee on investment uh, TT arbitration, where we looked at uh, this very issue. And I think from the, from the user's perspective, 
uh, I think there is a broader recognition that there is uh, a need for a reform. Uh, I think the, the system would benefit from constructive reform. I think the, the key concern at least uh, that, the, that the investors have uh, is that uh, their voice is not adequately represented in the debate. Uh, and I think that is where perhaps as our arbitration community, uh, I think we were a little late to the debate. Uh, I think there was a, if I could call it that, an apologism paranoia, uh, fearing that our views might be taken as partisan. And, and I think therefore an opportunity was missed earlier in the debate to avoid the discourse being contaminated by misconceptions or ivory tower views, uh, which in some instances compromised the integrity of the debate. And I think Jan touched upon that. Uh, now, uh, I think in terms of looking at uh, the current reform process, and I think kind of comparing the incremental reform versus a structural reform, uh, I think there is a, there is a concern within the, within the users community that uh, whilst you know, we are looking at a reforming process, a large number of criticisms are actually directed at substantive reform, which has now been excluded from the work of the UNSTRAL working group. And in fact, you know, we will be talking a lot more about consistency and coherency. Uh, but if you now look at the evolution of the debate, uh, people are no longer kind of focused on consistency, right? People are focusing on uh, substantive correctness. Uh, and I think there's a wider kind of uh, perception within the state community that you know, some of the substantive protections have been given a wrong meaning, right? They've, they've been uh, given such an expansive meaning that uh, now there is what is called a regulatory chill. Uh, but I think then one needs to then break that criticism down and then look at it and say, well, if it is a substantive problem, the response has to be a substantive one. You know, states are free to redefine or restate their treaty obligations if they are unhappy with how they have been interpreted. And at a bilateral level, that is exactly how the states have responded to it. You know, we've seen that in the context of India, you have joint interpretative statements, you have a new model BIT, and each of these instruments sets out how these states uh, would like the precise contours of those substantive obligations to be, to be defined. I think the real difficulty is that you can't have, I think it's not practical to have a substantive response at the multilateral level. Uh, there is simply no prospect today of a multilateral consensus on, on these protections. And, and that is where uh, I think a, a disconnect has happened because in addressing, addressing some of these substantive issues, uh, you know, rather than looking at kind of, you know, the 2600 BITs and, and, and the lack of uniformity there, uh, there's been a, a reaction to say, well, we are going to resolve all these issues. The panacea is going to be a procedural reform. Uh, and, and I think that is where, you know, there is a, there's a bit of a disconnect. And I think uh, now there is again, greater recognition of that. And, and again, exit reforms, which are focused on the, the process-based criticism go a long way towards addressing some of the issues that users had highlighted. If I may, I just wanted to take a, a couple of minutes to, to, to pick on a couple of points regarding the code of conduct. Uh, and, and Marika, I think you raised the question as to, as to the ne real need for this code of conduct when you have the IBA guidelines uh, on conflict of interest and, and also issues regarding multiple rules or what is referred to as uh, double hatting. I think if you, if you look at how the system is structured, uh, adjudicators in ISGS cases have generally exhibited a, a great in, a level of integrity. And under the current system, the market will sanction bad arbitrators, you know, arbitrators who do not prove their competence, who do not render decisions in a timely manner or show questionable ethics are unlikely to be reappointed. That said, I think uh, within the investor community in particular, I think there is a recognition now that a universal code for, of conduct for adjudicators uh, is indeed desirable and necessary. And you don't have to, to take my word for it. If you look at the, the papers that were submitted by the Corporate Council International Arbitration Group, uh, both with ICSID and UNCITAL Working Group 3, uh, I think they described the absence of such a code as a glaring flaw uh, in the current system. And I think on the IBA guidelines, uh, again, you know, people recognize the significant contribution it has made to the resolution of ethical issues. But I think the, the, there is a recognition that these are optional guidelines designed for all arbitration cases and perhaps they're not specifically tailored 
two ISDS cases. And again, uh, you know, states have said, well, they were not really drafted, you know, with benefit from a lot of states as well. Uh, now, uh, again, perhaps, you know, what juries out on, on whether that is right or not, but I think there is now a broader movement towards that. And I think, as Meg said, we will likely see uh, a consensus around a code of conduct. Uh, in terms of the, the main elements of it, and, and Meg has talked about those, and I won't, you know, regurgitate that. I think the, the one issue I did want to touch upon, which I think has significant practical ramifications, uh, relates to the extensive disclosure uh, that is being envisaged. And I think that, that does present uh, practical issues in, in terms of kind of the, the cost benefit analysis. Uh, and, and again, there are, there are real kind of benefits to some of the disclosures that are being envisaged. For example, uh, you know, disclosure is required uh, of, and again, you know, it's, it's subject to further discussion of all cases in which a candidate or an adjudicator has been or is, is currently involved in, in multiple roles as a counsel, as an arbitrator, as an expert. Uh, and then you have this very extensive disclosure obligation to regarding everything that you may have ever published, any public speech uh, that you may have ever delivered to the extent it's relevant. Uh, now, there is value in it. You know, of course, the user community uh, would like to know more about the availability of uh, the different candidates. You know, they can make better decisions about appointments, knowing whether a candidate has 40 or 50 TT appointments, which, which some arbitrators do, or whether, you know, they'll be able to devote uh, adequate time to it. However, there is a there is a practical question as to uh, you know how this disclosure obligation would actually work. You know, would it simply require you to disclose a number of cases, or would you also have to reveal the details of those cases, which are, which is I think what is being envisaged in terms of conflicts of interest? Uh, then again, you know, there is a suggestion that you sh you should disclose not only publicly available cases but all international arbitration cases. And again, that will raise issues of, of confidentiality. And the rationale for disclosure here is, well, uh, disclose anything that could be perceived as affecting your independence or impartiality. And, and again, uh, you know, are you then going to have to disclose the nature of the issues in each of those cases that you are involved in? Uh, and, and similarly, you know, with the disclosure of public speeches, you know, not every public speech is recorded like this webinar, and again, you're going to have a lot of, uh, you know, onerous uh, requirements being imposed on adjudicators, which I think the exit uh, working paper recognizes of having to, to assess in each case where you approach, whether, you know, you may have said something 10 years ago, uh, for example, about the meaning of a substantive protection, if, if that's going to be relevant. And, and this is a continuing obligation of disclosure. You keep disclosing. And again, uh, I think there's a concern that this may stifle frank exchange of views because a lot of the senior adjudicators and arbitrators are also the leading scholars in the field. Uh, so again, as Max said, these are some of the issues that we need to look at in detail, but I think generally speaking, uh, the code has been well received within the community. Thank you, thank you Manish. Um, but again, I, I, I see your, your concerns, you know, how far should we go? I think that when I worked for Aubrey on Vandenberg, who has done many, many cases on arbitrator, he said, when in doubt, disclose. And to be honest, it really doesn't take that much effort to disclose. And we did a bunch of panels in Miami between judges, leadership of institutions, arbitrators, and lawyers. And it were the judges who said, but don't you just know in your core when you should disclose or not? So there is just simply a good faith element to this as well. And the concern we see right now is that this exact point, which we also see in the questions that are being raised, the club, the, the arbitrator mafia, la 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 la, uh, it's not diverse, that we go from that and we just jump right over incremental reforms into this multilateral investment court or this appellate body where you have sovereign permanent appointments. And, and whenever the, the pro uh, court or mechanisms tell me that's for diversity, that's simply a false statement. It is not going to be diverse. We know the type of group of judges that we're going to have. And that's not the current pool of new, gener uh, the new generation of arbitrators. And Albert Jan Vandenberg himself said, those stories out there, of arbitrators failing to disclose, 
deciding not to disclose, forgetting to do a conflict of interest check within their firm, forgetting to, to mention that they're on board. Um, that's, he said that's, that's the, of a different tradition, uh, the, the other generation. The new generation isn't like that. And I'm sure you agree with me that with the code of conduct, with whatever other guidelines, these criticisms can be addressed. And instead of just jumping to a mic. Now, we're running out of time. Um, what I would like to do here, since it's really important, uh, Pramod, to talk about the appellate mechanism. This is something that at every single webinar, we park it at the end, but this is actually the one thing that the delegates want to talk about. So I'm going to skip one segment to jump right into the appellate mechanism. We have James with us, who um, is an expert on WTO. As those who follow the UNSTO Working Group 3 know, the UNSTO Secretariat posts papers and they refer to the WTO. So th they need inspiration. Inspiration has been the Mauritius Convention. Uh, inspiration have been certain tax treaties. Inspiration in the academic forum and inspiration comes from the w WTO. So with that, we are going to talk about this, this appellate body, if you will. Um, so the idea is this. Um, at the Working Group 3, we're not only talking about, or the stakeholders are not only talking about incremental reforms, they're talking about a multi-lateral report. We don't really know at this point what it is. First, that was an idea of this, this is going to be an actual building somewhere in the world with judges or adjudicators. And now some are saying, well, maybe it's going to be a virtual court with everything that we're learning in our online summer. Um, others now have said, well, maybe the court is a kind of a mixture where we are looking to PCA and ICSID as appointing authority. So it's, it's now a bit up in the air. Um, then the second thing is, well, you know, we should have maybe two tiers. So in, in addition to the multilateral investment court, we'll have an appellate body, or if the states are not comfortable with the multilateral investment court, we'll have the current system, but we'll add to that this layer um, of something that, that smells like appellate. Now, for those who are listening and those who will be tuning in later in the YouTube link, um, on the UNSTA Working Group 3 website, notes are being posted. Two notes that are particularly interesting for this topic is note number 185 and 169. Now, as many said, the Corporal Council Group has reacted to this and has sort of succinctly uh, compressed it all together with, with some uh, initial reactions by the users. And last weekend, a week ago, the UNSTO Secretariat posted two new notes about this appellate body asking the delegations to react. And we're going to try to assist those delegations in reacting to those notes. So with that, there, there is a lot. There is a lot to be unraveled when it comes to this appellate body or mechanism. Now, what we understand, and again, um, we might be wrong, is that this appellate mechanism would have adjudicators, and these adjudicators apparently are going to be appointed by the state, the contracting states, to the instrument that will create an appellate mechanism. Now, it has been said by our friend Salim Mulan at some of the previous webinars that there has to be a fair system, that maybe the states need to be some levels removed from the appointment processes, that obviously both users should have a say in the appointment processes. So maybe now it's open for discussion. We don't know. Now, why? Why this appellate body? One argument that has been used is that ISDS, Investor State Dispute Settlement, has been sort of is, is derived from international commercial arbitration. Why would this be a problem? Because investor state arbitration is different because of its public international law element, because of the role that sovereigns play, et cetera, and therefore we need to fix this. Um, one idea is this appellate mechanism because all the current arbitrations, it's an adjudication of one dispute. But in all those adjudication processes, certain uh, legal concept, legal principles are being interpreted. And the idea is that we need consistency, but we're still talking about procedure. We're not talking about substantive reforms. So Meg, my question to you is, um, do you think by adding this, this appellate mechanism or body, are we really going to have more consistency? Well, I think, first of all, there is a very legitimate perspective that there is actually not that much 
inconsistency. And while there are certainly some examples that everyone can pull out, most of these are older examples uh, from older case law. And what you find in arbitration is that the better cases end up being followed and the less useful cases just sort of go by the wayside. So the system does have a way that it creates an informal uh, consistency or an amount of consistency. You also have to remember in this different milieu, you have states who are able to write the treaties, who are able to uh, do notes of interpretation, do interpretations. So there are a lot of other correction mechanisms available. But I think the most important point is the one that Manish made. We have some 3,000 plus treaties. They are worded differently. They have different motivations, uh, different quid pro quos when they were negotiated. And so what's really, if there's any problem in terms of consistency, the biggest problem to crunch there is in terms of substantive standards. So to that extent, procedural mechanisms and procedural changes have perhaps uh, less of an impact. The other thing though that I think is worth noting is to the extent procedural changes can help with that discussion, those are happening. You're seeing increased transparency, which means you know what cases are out there, how were they reasoned, should they be followed. You have things like non-disputing treaty party participation. So you've got a full record of why a particular provision is written as it is and the object and purpose behind it. So I think that the kind of incremental reforms we've been talking about actually do address the consistency problem pretty well. And the major issue is substantive, which of course procedural changes don't really get to if there's substantive differences. Thank you, thank you, Meg. And again, for our audience, the working group three mandate is limited to procedure. That this is very clear, and those who were there at the origins, that's what they say, it's limited to procedure. Now, um, Jan, I would like to uh, go back to you. There have been so many discussions about the appointment processes, both for the multilateral investment board and the appellate mechanism. What we understand from studying the debates is that uh, the, the adjudicators are going to be appointed by the contracting states and that perhaps that is a way to create more consistency if ever there is inconsistency. Now, knowing the system as it works today and as it, how, as it has operated for so many decades, do you have anything to add on the envisaged appointment processes for this appellate mechanism? Well, let me just say that the search for consistency and predictability is the search for the philosopher's stone. It's not going to be found. It would be really handy if somebody once and for all would say that an MFN clause always incorporates dispute resolution or never incorporates a dispute resolution. But there is no such answer to be had because treaties are very different. It would be very handy if somebody would say once and for all, investor state treaties should be interpreted in such a way as to uphold the doctrine of the Barcelona traction case and diplomatic uh, protection, or not. One way or the other, let us know. I don't think that's going to happen either. And let me just take the, take the big one. What is the definition of a regulatory taking? Now, I have studied for decades the definition of regulatory taking under American law, under French law, under Swedish law, actually, and it is disheartening to me how little I have learned from all my reading. It is devilishly difficult to come up with a coherent uh, definition of that. So if it is thought that somehow by appointing the right people, even though they come from different countries, there is going to be finally, Eureka, a definition of regulatory taking, which will be applicable mechanis mechanistically, no matter how no matter the differences in new technologies that come to bear on, on, on what an investment actually is, uh, it simply isn't going to happen. And then why would you actually most nation, in, well, in many nation states, there are not, there's not just one appellate level, there's three. So if nation states can't figure out what regulatory takings, for example, are, and you uh, need to go to the Supreme Court to find out, um, this is something which, uh, is going to be left 
to the particularities of, of individual cases and to the discernment of those who are adjudicating it at a particular time. And I don't think that there, there is any class of individuals who, uh, who, who, will, who will come out with this. And if, if, we are, if what we're looking at is 10 years of disputation after a first decision has been made, uh, it's not going to be attractive. And I certainly hope that no system like that becomes obligatory. Let it be optional and see how many take up on it. And, and this is another thing where we see a change from sort of the early times of the working group three and now over the summer is that more and more voices are saying, well, we're talking about optionality. It's not either the current system or something new. It's not, it seems like we're no longer throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Let's see. Now, James, there have been so many references to WTO. Um, last weekend, these two note notes were posted. They were shared with the delegations last Tuesday. They're on top of the Working Group 3 website. In those notes, um, the spe specifically the one on the appellate body, paragraph 5, 36, and 37 for the listeners, um, the secretary talks about the, the scope of review. Right, so once you've ha you have this award, how much can these appellate judges review? And the Secretariat thinks about the facts and the law and ultimately says, quoting, a mixed question of law and fact may arise as shown and addressed by the jurisprudence of the WTO appellate body. Now, James, enlighten us. Well, what do we need to know here? So thank you, Mary Kay. In fact, it is a, it's a very interesting issue in the context of trade law. So in the context of the WTO appellate body, the WTO appellate body can only examine issues of law. It cannot actually, it cannot examine issues of fact. But at the same time, if a particular tribunal, a panel has examined a factual issue with a view to resolving a legal matter, to explain, the, to explain in simple terms, whether a country has complied with the WTO obligations by passing a domestic law. So it is a factual issue. And this factual issue can, may have a legal characterization. The WTO appellate body can only look at legal issues and not factual issues. And how this has been uh, you know, negotiated under the WTO is even more interesting. So when a WTO panel, which is actually a first instance tribunal, makes a factual determination, that factual determination will be subject matter of an interim review. So that means, the report will be released between the parties and the parties will give their comments. And if there is any manifest error, if there is a complete uh, wrong appreciation of the facts, then the panel itself can actually correct it before the report is released. So there is an inbuilt mechanism within the WTO to make sure that manifest errors or gross error, errors of factual uh, evidence can be corrected at the panel stage itself. So with respect to, uh, with respect to uh, the, uh, the legal issues, so again, the WTO appellate body very clearly says that it has to be a question of law. I should also tell you that it is, this division is not so easy. So now let me, I mean, talk about one of India's cases, actually. It is a very old case. So India had, uh, had to bring in patent law. So by 20, 2005, in the meantime, from 1995 until 2005, India has to provide pipeline protection for patents through exclusive marketing rights. India did not actually make a statutory change because of uh, because there was change in governments during that time, and the Indian government came up with an executive order. So the matter was: Has India actually maintained deference to WTO law by passing adequate domestic proceedings? The WTO panel said that whether there is a domestic law in India has to be interpreted as a question of fact. It is actually municipal; it is a municipal law, and therefore it is a question of fact. But at the same time, we can actually call this as a legal characterization. It is an issue of law as well. So on the panel finding, the appellate body can examine this particular issue. So that is why I said in many issues, in, uh, in, the, in the context of WTO, the United States has been raising this matter for the last several years. Their argument is that the appellate body is actually overreaching. The appellate body is getting into a terrain where they have no business to get into. And all these complications are arising because the boundaries between what is actually a question of fact and what is a question of law is completely blurred. So in the matter of, in the matter of developing an affiliate mechanism for uh, ISDS, I completely understand the concerns for coherence and consistency and predictability. But at the same time, when a judge or an arbitrator 
examines an issue and gives a ruling, some people can call it a question of law, even if it is actually built on a question of fact. So th this is one particular concern which the negotiators will have to take into account. There are, um, there are umpteen examples of this mixed question of fact and law. And that is one particular concern, at least in the context of the WTO. So now let me tell you what, I, what has happened to the WTO. Until 2017, the WTO was appellate mechanism was called the crown jewel. So the former chairman of the appellate board said, what actually happened to a crown jewel, which was working so well in the last uh, 25 years, and now it is the most unwanted organ. It is now on the verge of a collapse. So the point is that sometimes even well-functioning bodies can actually face an extinction or a existential threat if some of these boundaries are not well kept. So I, I would like to just point out this problem. So this is very interesting, James, because throughout in all these unsuitable secretary notes or some submissions of, of delegations, we the WTO is kind of referred to as look at this great, great example to follow, right? Um, you're the expert. And you're actually pointing out, well, wait a second, you know, mixed fact and law, it's actually fact with sort of a legal flavor and we just bring it in through the back door and we open the floodgates. But moreover, this appellate body is, seems to be in the timeout chair. Right. Um, so, so are we smart kind of using the WTO as an example? Um, I have the same question actually with the Mauritius Convention on Transparency, which is great, but I believe we have about five five countries where it entered into force and 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 so why are we using those examples when either they they still need to do a lot of uh, promotional tours and, and road shows for Mauritius and with the wto they're in the timeout chair and then again you know i keep on coming back to it the new york convention 163 contracting states and we risk losing the use of that treaty and and when jan talks about it, it takes a long time to create something new what people tend to forget the new york convention that had to replace treaties from the 20s the 1920s took five years five years to draft um so actually james well, what we can learn from you as the expert is perhaps we need to be very careful when we look at the wto in terms of harmonization because that's what we're looking at with all these standards and how is it being interpreted by all these tribunals we need to harmonize and let's look at them and your answer is well maybe we need to think twice before before we do that is that correct absolutely absolutely so there are two important issues here the one is basically what is actually a question of fact and what is a question of law and definitely if you're limiting the appeal mechanism only to question of law then the mixed question of fact and law can become a major problem the second issue is definitely standard of review and this is again, I think it trenches on the area of sovereignty. So as most of you know, I think uh, in WTO mechanism at least, there is, a, uh, there is actually a wire media between total deference and de novo review. So in some of the cases they said that a WTO panel to the extent possible will respect the decision making of the earlier adjudicator. Only in very, very ext uh, what you, extraordinary situations, they will completely overturn the findings. So the United States, I should also, I would like to mention a, a special standard of review with the United States negotiated in Article 17.6 of the Antidemy Agreement. So they said that uh, an appellate court can only look into the issue where the initial, the in, initial trial has completely failed to apply objective appreciation of facts and has improperly examined the issues. So what is actually objective and what is improper? Again, you know, there are many shades of gray in that thing. So that is why, you know, I'm, I'm sure that if these issues are not tackled at the very beginning, they can come to haunt you later. So what is actually, what should be the standard of review? Should it be a total deference? Should it be actually leaning towards a de novo review? I think on these issues, there should be more, I think, more structured discussions within the uncertain view. This is probably another way to look at the efficacy of the appellate body of the WTO. Uh, do you have a sense of how many times panel reports have been appealed before an appellate body? And how many times has the appellate body set aside the decision of the panel? Because that, in many ways, will illustrate the efficacy of the appeals process and the need for an appeals process. Absolutely. I promote that is an excellent question. So in the context of WTO, there have been around 600 cases we can say that nearly 400 have actually come out with a panel report. Out of this 400, nearly 200 have actually produced an appellate body report. And in appellate body, my feeling is that in, in more than 97% of the cases, the appellate court has actually overturned some part of the panel findings. 
some part of the finding, not all of them, but at least some part of the fan, final finding. So the possibility of a success in an appeal proceeding was extremely high. And this is again something. So there is something called an Article 11 uh, standard of review under the WHO. That means if the, uh, the panel has failed to make an objective assessment of the facts, it can be camouflaged as a legal claim and brought to the appellate court. In 99% of the cases, all these factual issues were brought to the appellate court as a question of law, although it was actually a matter relating to the appreciation of facts. And there was no filter. There was absolutely no filter in the WHO mechanism to avoid these kind of claims. And that actually, to my, to my understanding, that led to the delay in the proceeding. The appellate court only had 90 days to come out with the report. Sometimes they took almost a year to come out with the reports. So that led to the delay in the proceeding. And that also led to excessive criticism by some of the stakeholders. So if an appellate court has to function very clearly, I mean, very, very effectively, there should be filters. Not every case can actually go to the appellate court. In that case, you know, I think uh, you will be duplicating in the panel process. There will be reappreciation of facts and evidence. That shouldn't happen. So appellate, to my understanding, appellate function should be limited to manifest errors. Manifest errors either in the appreciation of facts or in the assessment of them. Thank, thank you, James. So the, here we go again. The, the devil is in the detail. It looks like we, we haven't really gone to the bottom of, of all those details. Now, again, getting back to your point on efficiency and timing, this is going to take a long time. Um, as everyone knows, whether it's UNCITROL or ICSID, there are already uh, annulment and setting aside mechanisms. So for UNCITROL, uh, the unhappy party can file for the setting aside of, of an award under the national laws on arbitration. Um, and with ICSID, there is an annulment provision within the ICSID mechanism. And the, the Working Group 3 seems to acknowledge that. Um, in their new note, which is now open for commentary, they may wish to note that as the grounds for appeal normally encompass the narrow grounds for annulment and setting aside, the existence of an appeal could be seen as making any further review, including annulment or setting aside, redundant. Um, keeping the annulment or setting aside remedies might de facto create a three-tier dispute settlement system, which might run contrary to the objectives of finality and efficiency. So they themselves, the, the leadership, the stakeholders, recognize that this is going to be very complex. Um, and with Meg, I would like to um, ask you, you know, what can we do here? I mean, uh, let's just focus uh, on on replacement? Do we just have the appellate function? Um, uh, what, what are your reaction to, to this now that it's in the new note? Well, I think just pragmatically, it's very clear you can't have three-tiered review. You'll be doing this forever and it will cost fortune. Uh, so what I think realistically we are talking about is trying to have a tribunal level and then a way that you could go to appeal if that's what the state wanted or annulment if that's what the state wanted. And I can see different situations. You may want that broader appeal function for things like treaty, but do you really want that kind of broad review for contract? There are a lot of distinctions to be made here. And I think from a pragmatic perspective, we are probably facing a world where we are operating systems in tandem so that you have some states that wanna stay with the current system of uh, a first level tribunal and either New York Convention or exit annulment, and others who want to have the first level and then appeal. And a number of uh, parties in the Working Group 3 exercise have tried to bridge those a little bit by suggesting a standard of review, which would be essentially uh, Article 52 1A to E, which are the classic arbitration types of review, and then add on error of law. And then, of course, the debate, which is a, a, what James has talked about, do you have review for a manifest error of fact as well, and all the difficulties that that brings up. So I think we're facing a world where, uh, for better or for worse, we are probably going to have those two systems in tandem. And doing that, we've got to think long and hard about how do you make them as efficient as possible, and what's going to happen in terms, in particular, of enforcement. I mean, at the end of the day, enforcement is the number one thing. And that's been, you know, certainly the hallmark of ICSID has been the effective enforcement, similarly with the New York Convention. And uh, a very big concern is that we don't lose that as we have these discussions and try and think about whether 
other options are necessary. Thank you. Now, Manish, when we talk about enforcement, um, what is important to understand is this would be an appellate body, a new one, right? Um, so it's not ICSID where you have the ICSID convention for, for enforcement. It will not be UNCTRL and, and the New York Convention. Some will say, well, you can have an opt-in convention and, and contracting states to the instrument can say, we're just going to say that this is arbitration. We're going to say that this is a permanent arbitration court under Article 1, two. we're going to say that this is an award, but it's a bit more complex uh, for that. So with the appellate body, not the multi-level investment court, the appellate body, what are you view, your views um, for enforcement under the New York Convention? Thanks, Mary. Uh, I think there, there now appears to be a broader consensus within the working group and, and also in academic commentary that if an appellate body were to be set up, uh, its founding convention must include uh, a self-contained mechanism for recognition and enforcement, similar to what you have in Article 54 of the Exit Convention, that will then require the states that sign up to that founding convention to, to recognize the decision of an appellate mechanism, uh, you know, and enforce the obligations, the pecuniary obligations arising out of that uh, in the same manner as if were a, a final judgment of the court. So you, there is that recognition that it should have its own mechanism. However, uh, as, you, as you pointed out earlier as well, such a solution would only bind parties to that founding convention or parties that opt into that mechanism. And, and therefore, there is then a, a, a real issue which is now being explored uh, in the Secretariat notes as to how enforcement and recognition of awards uh, could be effected in states that do not opt into the, the mechanism. Uh, and again, you know, one, one is focused very heavily on uh, the New York Convention, for example. And again, you know, I, I speak with a certain trepidation knowing that some of the leading scholars of of the New York Convention are, are on this webinar. But uh, I think, the, uh, as you said, whatever these uh, opting conventions or founding conventions may stipulate, when requested to enforce uh, or recognize an appellate mechanism decision, uh, it is the court of a non-participating state that would then have to assess uh, whether the objective requirements of the convention as implemented in the domestic law uh, have been satisfied. Uh, and, and again, as you, as you identified, there's a whole host of issues that the host states will have to grapple with. You know, is, does it meet the definition of an orbital award? Uh, whether if it is going to be uh, an a-national regime, whether that falls within the scope of the convention and you know, whether it falls within the commercial reservation. And, in, in the interest of time, I just wanted to, to highlight one issue that has been the subject of a lot of academic debate, which is would an appellate mechanism award actually be an award within the meaning of the New York Convention? And again, uh, as you pointed out, Marik, uh, the, the real issue is whether Article 1-2 of the Convention, which covers not only awards made by arbitrators appointed by the parties, but also those made by permanent arbitral bodies to which the parties have submitted, whether, whether that would capture any decisions of an appellate mechanism. And again, uh, textually one could say it's arguable, uh, but again, you know, the jury is still out on that. There's a lot of uh, uncertainty on that. Uh, the convention's travel preparatoire, uh, again, do not give you a clear answer. And again, uh, you know, several scholars, including I know Malik, you, you've, you've written about that, have kind of questioned whether an appellate mechanism uh, comprised of uh, you know, permanent uh, adjudicators appointed by the states, whether, you know, whether it's really a judicial or a quasi-judicial mechanism, uh, and whether its decisions are arbitral awards or whether it's actually uh, you know, going to be excluded because of that. And again, uh, you know, there are other scholars which are saying, well, uh, it's not really your choice uh, you know, in terms of appointment of adjudicators that is relevant here. The real question here is whether you have voluntarily submitted to a dispute resolution system, which they say would be uh, satisfied by accept, you know, uh, an investor accepting a host state's offer to arbitrate that has this appellate mechanism attached to it. People often refer to uh, the jurisprudence of the U.S. courts, where you have uh, the decisions of the Iran-U.S. claims tribunal uh, being recognized and enforced 
uh, as decisions of a permanent orbital body. Uh, but again, you know, the real issue here is that there is this uncertainty and it, is this uncertainty regarding enforcement really something that is going to be acceptable to the users? Now, uh, I've heard arguments being made that, you know, meaning of expressions such as arbitral awards in the New York Convention are all kind of free from domestic law considerations, you know, like questions of public international law. But I think, again, uh, some scholars have said, well, that really ignores the ground reality that, uh, you know, a, a lot of the states are not monist states. You know, it's not that New York Convention is actually self-executing. You're relying on uh, your states to have implemented legislation. And then when the national courts are looking at enforcement, that the off, and again, we know that from the Indian experience, they're going to be very heavily focused on the text of the implementing legislation. And again, uh, are you then going to amend all these legislations to provide for greater clarity? And again, there's a suggestion, well, you know, UNCITRAL can issue a recommendation uh, clarifying this point, but you know, we've all seen how national courts approach these, these issues. Uh, there's also going to be a separate issue about, I know we, we talked about it in the context of annulment, uh, what about the grounds for non-recognition and non-enforcement in Article 5? Uh, now, EU seems to be envisaging that, you know, uh, that will be excluded, but really are other states going to accept uh, exclusion of public policy as a ground for, uh, you know, the limited review that you have at, at the stage of recognition and enforcement? And is that then going to create, as you said, a three-year, uh, you know, system again, because at the stage of enforcement, you will again have somebody looking at the very same issues which may have been looked at uh, the appellate level. So I think there are lots of kind of practical issues which uh, working group uh, and the secretariat pap you know, papers record, but they don't really offer you, uh, you know, a real solution within the existing framework. Yes, it just makes me want to weep right now on Saturday. Um, one thing I just really don't understand is in 2008, Albert Jan and I had made this really fun academic Miami draft to look at a replacement of the New York Convention. It was an academic exercise because there are so many inconsistencies in the worldwide application of the New York Convention, like you say, by national judges applying an act that has been implemented and is part of national law. And um, the fact that that could not be done at the time at the UNSTO level because God forbid we would replace the New York Convention and now we're replacing so much more than that and we talk about multilateral instruments and uh, framework wheels and docking stations and opt-in conventions. Um, we're just so lost right now and, and these recommendations you talk about, you know, what do the judges do? Um, with ICA there is an a yearbook that reports all the cases worldwide every year. Some of us have studied those thousands of decisions and the UNSTO recommendations for Article 2 and 7 have never been applied by a judge. And this is now mentioned in the new note as a possible solution, which is interesting because it, the old recommendations have not yet proven to be a solution. So again, what, what we know is there's a, an immense level of uncertainty and complexity, and then James also points it out. Think, think this through. The devil is in the detail. What Jan also points out. Now we have about 25 minutes left. This is what we're going to do. We've talked about not we, just all the webinars, all the time, all the conferences over the last years have talked about incremental reforms, a little bit of tweaking here and there. There are the structural reforms, the multilateral court and this appellate body. But now there, there is something else that could maybe prove the solution. Uh, the one sort of magic um, philosopher's stone of Harry Potter, if you will, um, which is okay, it looks like this appellate body seems to be a, a happy compromise. Um, but why have a separate appellate body? Because then we, we bump into all these issues, which we just sort of highlighted in, in the half an hour time frame. Um, is there a way to have a, something that smells like appellate within the current system? Now, this has been um, already described in these two new notes, but given that we have the Secretary General of Exit, Meg, could you set out what this could look like? Uh, yeah, and let me preface this with, uh, I don't have magic bullets, but I think there's some discussion that can legitimately be had. 
and we are at a very preliminary stage of this discussion and I think this is probably the most complex legal problem around right now but the idea is as you say you have very well functioning international organizations like ICSID why go to the cost of a new organization you've got the the, the machinery, the expertise, you've got the global reach, and in particular, it's a, a very effective enforcement mechanism. And this has been brought up before. Um, some will recall that in 2004, ICSID actually proposed what they called an appellate facility. And at the time, the idea was that this appellate facility could review investor state dispute uh, decisions or awards under the ICSID convention, the additional facility the UNCITRAL rules and any other rules that uh, were covering investor state. And the main barrier or difficulty with this, of course, was Article 53 of the ICSID Convention, which says uh, that awards are binding, uh, but uh, not subject to any appeal or other remedy other than in the Convention. And of course, the remedy in the Convention, first and foremost, is annulment. Uh, so the question was, how do you manage that and keep the binding force? In the 2004 proposal, what was suggested was that basically Article 53 and the relevant Articles 54 in particular could be modified under Article 41 of the Vienna Convention. And Article 41 of the Vienna Convention is essentially where you have a multilateral convention and less than the whole decides to modify it. And essentially it says you can have this inter se modification as long as it doesn't affect the rights and obligations of other states under the treaty. In other words, they can keep what they had and not go along with the modification. And if the derogation or the modification is not incompatible with the object and purpose of the treaty as a whole. Uh, so basically the 2004 proposal said you could use this Article 41 that the modification would really only affect those signing onto it. It would not take away the rights of the non-joiners, the ones who wanted to stay with the current system, and that it was compatible with the object of the Exit Convention, which is peaceful dispute resolution of investor state disputes. And again, that proposal suggested the five grounds that you already have under Article 52, the five annulment grounds, plus uh, error of law, and optional to be discussed, manifest error of fact with all of the, the concerns we've raised this morning. And then this appellate facility could uphold, modify or reverse the award, or if necessary, annul. Um, and that those awards as modified would be binding and enforceable. Uh, you can see there are a lot of things to talk about in each of those pieces, but essentially that was the overall proposal. And at the time when it was brought to states, they all said, this is premature, let's not go there. This discussion obviously is now with us again in 2019. And in particular, as you say, the most recent working paper from Working Group 3 has addressed it. As well, there's an article by Albert Jan Vandenberg in the ICSID review of 2019 that does a very good job of setting out the issues both under New York Convention and ICSID. But what we have right now, I think, are two mechanisms or ways of going about incorporating an appellate option. And remember, it's an option. It's not either annulment or appellate, but you could opt into an ICSID framework. Um, and the first of these is, again, going back to the idea from 2004 and invoking Article 41 of the Vienna Convention. The other possibility to discuss is a, a new one, I think. And the idea there would be that you actually could amend the ICSID Convention. It has its own amendment formula, which says 100% of the members must agree to the amendment. I don't think anyone would put forward an amendment that says replace annulment by appeal because that's not going to be agreed to. You have not got any consensus on that. But what could be possible is to have an amendment that says states may elect the annulment remedy or the appeal remedy. And if they make that election, that then it could become an exit award with all of the enforceability that you wanna keep in this kind of a system. 
Um, there are, as you say, the devil in the details, and there'd have to be a lot of very careful wording and thinking through of the concept. But what I really wanted to say is that those seem to be the two main options that are being discussed at this point, if you wanted to try to incorporate this into an ICSID system. Jan, do you have any reactions to this? What are your views? To unmute yourself. Uh, not in particular. I think that it's, it's a very challenging thing uh, to imagine um, uh, to imagine how a complete uh, system is being is re-emerging out of this. Uh, so I can I can uh, there's a lot of food for thought here, and, and is it you'd have to be really certain that you're improving on what is existing, um, but it's an interesting exercise. No, but, but between sort of the original idea of creating this separate appellate body that is this new tier for all ISDS awards, whether it's UNSTOL or ICSID, or just looking, just keeping the system as is, but adding something within the system. Well, even in the way you formulate the question, which I there's nothing biased and, and just stating the question the, the way you do it, uh, it, it is far uh, more straightforward to consider how adjustments can be made into a system that has been operating for half a century uh, and, 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 and recognizing what the difficulties have been in the scope that it currently has and what would be involved in expanding on it, then starting from scratch, and having the ambition, and some would say pretension, that this can cover all kinds of international dispute uh, adjudication uh, and just sort of hoping that it's not going to lead into, um, into great difficulties. Yes, and um, because it does seem here there's some optionality, there's an opt-in option. Now, James, given everything that we've learned from you, so there are these options of adding error of law and then there is the manifest error of, of, of fact where we now see some hurdles. What, what would your recommendations be? Just limit to error of law? Yeah, you know, the, so my suggestion was that it, uh, like in the context of WTO, it is very difficult to get something like an interim review. So in the WTO, the interim review will make sure that all manifest errors of facts can be corrected at that stage before the first instance report is issued. But so in the case of uh, an appeal mechanism, my feeling is that um, all man, only manifest errors of facts can be appealed. But questions of law, which may even involve treaty interpretation, can be appealed without any riders or conditions. But with respect to facts, only manifest errors of facts. Again, I think uh, one concept which I want to mention here in the in the trade context, there is something called a member control. Mm -hmm. So when an appeal, appeal mechanism works over a period of time, some members may actually think that this mechanism is not functioning in the manner that we had anticipated or envisaged. And this is precisely the problem with the WHO appellate body mechanism. The United States initially thought that this appeal mechanism will only review cases in the rarest or rare circumstances. But when all these cases came up before the appellate body and when they started losing, they thought that we had to get rid of the appellate body mechanism. So we had to be very careful at this stage. What do the members, what do the, the, the participating countries want from this mechanism? They, do they want an oversight of questions of law in every single case? Right? So, you know, there, there can be some kind of a concern. It, sometimes it may be um, uh, worked out on a case-by-case -case basis. So sometimes certain amount of ad hocism may be a good thing rather than having you know, one kind of an agreement which may apply the relationship between the parties forever. So some kind of an ad hocism in my view can be a good thing because now the, the even within the- oh, we just uh, lost you, I think. Yeah, even, can you hear me? I think we, we lost some sound here, but what, what we can, can take can... away from this is 
that um, there is a lot that needs Okay. I'm sorry, Medgi, can you hear me now? Uh, we can, yes. James. I think we can't hear Marie, though. Uh -huh. I think there was some kind, some kind of a chem communication break. Okay. Uh, James, what, what, what I have certainly learned from you today is that limiting things to review of questions of law is a lot easier said than done. Right, absolutely. Could I just raise uh, one point regarding, uh, you know, uh, kind of a potential appeals facility within the uh, auspices of of Exit? And again, Meg, you you will you will correct me if I've misunderstood. Uh, my understanding is that what was proposed in two thousand and four uh, was an appeals facility that was not going to be confined only to to exit cases, right? So you, you will still have some of the issues that have been identified otherwise, which is uh, states in relation to their other existing treaties, new treaties, which are not also parties to the exit convention, still having to sign up to some, you know, either the exit convention or another opt-in convention to, to then access uh, the, the exit appeals facility. So, uh, so in a way, you know, you will still have to have, you know, uh, some additional instrument uh, to to give or to generate a broader appellate access. It, it, yeah. I was just gonna, the, um, what I was speaking about really does only address in keeping the enforceability of an ICSID convention award. You're quite right. And if it's not an ICSID convention award and you want an appellate mechanism that deals with all investor state dispute settlement, which seems only logical because, again, you don't want further fragmentation, then you also have to address some of your problems in terms of uh, New York Convention, et cetera, if that's going to be your enforcement mechanism. Understood. Because you know, in a way, the, the root of inter-C modification also then kind of entails uh, that issue as well, uh, as you mentioned, Meg, because that modification can then only bind uh, the, the states that have then, you know, participated in that. Uh, exactly. but, then you, but, but again, you know, to the extent that you have other exit contracting states that have not uh, signed up to that, you will then again have that issue of, uh, you know, either those states, state courts applying the exit convention by analogy or, or actually looking at instruments such as New York Convention. And again, you, you will then have to kind of address uh, you know, the enforceability of exit awards in exit contracting parties uh, as a New York Convention award as well, right? Because it, 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 to the extent that these are the product of an inter se modification rather than an amendment under Article 66. Exactly. And that's perhaps why the amendment uh, via Article 66 is perhaps a more concrete way to go. Um, I've also heard discussion uh, that even if you had the inter se modification, perhaps what you could do is have some kind of a protocol where a state that did not take part in the modification, that didn't um, sign on to the appellate side of the house, would still agree that the award would be enforceable under the ICSID mechanism. I mean, that's like just another layer of complexity. But we've heard those kinds of suggestions to get around exactly the problem that you're bringing up. Um, so, so Meg, I, I dropped for a while, which seems that the internet in this house is not equally distributed, I guess. Um, but we have some time left, and there was one part that we skipped because we felt we were running out of time. And um, when we talk about exit and the sort of modifications or incremental reforms and improvements, solutions within exit, there is now, uh, Pramod, the, the other elephant in the room, which is we're, we're having an hosts in India, our India stakeholders, and India, Pramod. Would you, you like to talk a little bit about India and the exit? Well, I think uh, uh, 
it, it was actually surprising for me to, to actually read about the fact that India was a very active participant at the time when the ICSID convention was being negotiated and discussed. Uh, the Indian uh, delegate was quite active, made a number of interventions, and all these are documented in a very interesting World Bank publication published in the 1970s, the history of the ICSID convention. Uh, I think there were two main concerns that India had, and these are probably reasons as to why India did not accede or become a party to the convention. I think the first reservation that India had at the time, and bear in mind that this was the 1960s, where individuals had very little scope to enforce rights directly against the state. Uh, it's a very different position now. Uh, the position at that time and th that India took was that rights should not be conferred on foreign investors without at least the imposition of any countervailing obligations on them. So that was one reservation that was voiced. The second reservation that India had with respect to the way in which the ICSID uh, convention was ultimately drafted was that it, uh, in a sense, took away uh, the flexibility of a national court to uh, review an arbitration award on public policy and other grounds. And uh, I think India was against that on the basis that states have a role to play in ascertaining whether enforcement of awards, for instance, under the New York Convention, were contrary to public policy. And, and, and for a number of reasons, I mean, if these were the two main reasons as to why India was not a party, uh, decided not to become a party to ICSID, then I think the first objection to my mind is no longer valid. Uh, India has subsequently entered into around uh, 80 odd multilateral investment treaties with investment and of course multilateral treaties with investment chapters as well, all of which confer rights on foreign investors, uh, which are directly enforceable against the state. So therefore, the fact that an individual has standing to bring a claim on the international plane is now recognized in a number of other treaties which India is a party. As far as the second concern is, is, is concerned, I mean, I think it still subsists that a state should have a margin of discretion in refusing to enforce arbitration awards that would be contrary uh, to the public policy of that state. Uh, but at the same time, the other dynamic here is the fact that even if a state court refuses to enforce an arbitration award in its home state, an arbitral award is easily transportable and could be enforced against state assets elsewhere. So in many ways, I think the two principal bases of India's objection to become a party to the exit convention uh, may no longer hold good. And I think uh, it's probably uh, worthwhile for India to reconsider its stance. The, the other reason could be political. Uh, I think India's first BIT was in 1994 and around 40 odd BITs were concluded in the 1990s. And this was at a time when India was undergoing a fairly painful uh, structural adjustment program that was being supervised by the Bretton Woods institutions. And at that time, probably politically, uh, the Bretton Woods institutions were probably a controversial topic in political discourse. And then for India to sign up to another treaty, which was essentially sponsored by the Bretton Woods institutions, uh, would probably not have uh, been a very wise move politically. But after 1991, when India embarked on a program of economic liberalization, and probably uh, in the first part of the century, when it attained uh, consistent GDP growth rates of eight to nine per, uh, touching up to 10%, I think the mood has changed. And it's probably now a good time uh, for India to revisit its stance to the exit convention. Uh, whether it has to be the exit convention or the multilateral investment court or incremental reforms uh, to the existing uh, ISDS mechanisms are all open issues. And I think as far as uh, India is concerned, I would really hope that it engages on all three fronts with an open mind and, and takes a, a, a prudent decision, which uh, I think it should be in keeping with India's role um, uh, as, as an important state uh, and as a state which can also in, in many ways influence the actions of other developing countries. So I think, Meg, we, we've talked about this in the past, um, doing, as you know, ICA, the International Council for Commercial Arbitration, has for long embarked upon roadshows and judicial dialogues on the New York Convention. And we had a plan a while ago to do sort of a joint ICA exit roadshow in the Caribbean. And, and whenever the world is back to normal, we'll get on a plane to come to India. And um, as Nigel Blackaby said about two weeks ago, when it comes to the exit convention, there are those certain Latin American states who denounced it, but they came back. And Vermont, let's hope that India um, finds its pathway towards this treaty that seems to be, this convention that seems to be now incorporating incremental reform solutions and even maybe some sort of appellate flavored pathway. And um, with that, I'm very proud of my Dutchness because it's, uh, 
24. We've got six minutes left, Gaurav. And with that, you have still enough time to close this webinar. Well, uh, thank you, Marik. It's been a very, very interesting discussion. A lot of new points have come up and I've been listening carefully right through. Uh, it started off with Jan with his propositions. But the one which appealed to me uh, quite a bit was the devil is in the details. So obviously when we consider what the working group has to be looking at, people should look at what is on the table very, very carefully. Meg talked about uh, you know, the code of conduct. Uh, that is something that reverberates through investment arbitration, commercial arbitration. I mean, it has such a wide range and obviously uh, how ICSID is dealing with it. Manish talked about the role of the investor, something that has really not been focused on, particularly uh, at the present, uh, conceding that it is the states who, who are driving the reform process, but it's really up to the investors to step up to the plate. Uh, then we went to the multinational investment, uh, multilateral investment court. We went to the, uh, the appellate mechanism. Then we had a very interesting, completely different insight about how the WTO appellate mechanism works. I think that has fed into the discussion. I think that's something new that has come up. And thank you, James, for, for you know, going through the questions of law, um, question of fact, mixed question of law, how, how that would work out. Um, we had a nice uh, insight about uh, the, you know, the, the, the three-tier, two-tier system. We had a debate about the New York Convention and Manish went, um, uh, sort of highlighted the Article 1-2 problem. Um, and then we came to, according to me, to, to my mind, a very interesting part, which I was not aware of, which is the attempt by ICSID to uh, amend the convention and have an appellate facility and use Article 41. And maybe that may be a solution that the working group may consider. But I mean, the, 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 the conspectus of all this is, that there are a, a large number of issues yet to be worked out. And uh, um, certainly this is a very sensitive area. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, the Ancitral has allotted additional working group, uh, uh, time to this working group. And one really has to consider all the options a little carefully. It's very difficult to summarize uh, seven brilliant, six brilliant speakers in four minutes, but I'm that's my best shot. So on that note, we are not yet at six o'clock. We are three minutes to go. Uh, may I thank each and every one of the speakers, the two moderators. Uh, may I thank Jindal Global Law School, Ika, uh, Live Law, Rashid. And uh, last but not the least, this being a Saturday morning in Washington, evening in Delhi, uh, our wonderful audience who stayed with us for the last uh, couple of hours, which has just flown by. Thank you very much um, and uh, keep safe. Thank you. Thank you.